Welcome to the Fancier Brew Podcast. I'm Andy, the Northern Diver. In this series, I'll be discussing adventure, conservation, and progression in scuba diving with some really interesting and inspirational divers that you might or not have heard of. The podcast is supported by Northern Diver International and you, the listener, through Patreon. So grab yourself a brew and enjoy this week's episode. Okay then, Tony Seddon, welcome to Fancy Brew Podcast, mate. Have you got a brew here? I have. I've got a coffee, which is right. always important to get me going in the morning and through the day. See, I love that I say this too many times now. I probably need to just stop bothering saying it, but I love the smell of coffee, but can't stand the taste of it at all. You just need more sugar in it, that's all. You just get it <laughs> so it's, you know, it's dark as sin, you know, sweet yeah. as sin, and, and not to say it's so hot as either, but, you know, just like that. Yeah. Uh, it's a great thing. So I've had, I've had a few of my mates who they started having their own coffee um, roasted, you know, with different flavours with it and having it freeze packed or whatever they do and get it delivered oh, once that. a month. And I'm like, I- I'd like to be that kind of keen, but I just don't like it. Give me a PG tips any day. <laughs> We're no, all right. That, makes sense. that makes sense. I think for me, my only luxury is that I'd, I will have it kind of not instant. Uh, my last job, I spent a lot of time drinking instant coffee. At the end of 10 years, that I said, Never again. Uh, if I can't have coffee that's at least been kind of sitting there and pressed and all that malarkey, then yeah. I will have it because it's an outroll with milk and two sugars. <laughs> Fair one. So do you want to give us a little brief, mate, about who you are and, and perhaps why I've got you on? Don't give too much away, though, because we'll have, we'll have a five-minute podcast then. Okay. Well, it might be very short anyway, because what I'd say <laughs> is that I'm not a diver. Uh, I'm a caver who dives, and it was always part of that package. Um, so started heaven help us a bit over 30 years ago as a very young man thought i want to be a caver and i want to do tough caves and i want to be a cave diver and then after that it's what i've done i mean the the motivations changed a whole load over 30 years you'd expect yeah um but that's that's how it started and i seem to have not fallen out of love with it entirely yet ace i um i remember when i spoke to phil short and i was like so uh do you dive in like boiler suits and wellies? And he and I didn't expect him to say yeah, <laughs> and he pretty much did. And I was like, so you don't take any fins? And, and obviously my preconceived ideas of what cave diving is, is the beautiful cenotes over in Mexico, crystal clear water, and this beautiful frog kick going through. And it's all lit up because they've, they've pre-placed lights when in actual fact, it's not like that at all, is it? Not quite. I and mean, if, you, if you are in... Europe, then it can be a lot nicer, uh, though not always. And where I dive a lot in the Yorkshire Dales, there's a lot of peat on the uplands, so the water going into the caves can actually have a whole load of sediment in it. So in some ways, you've got the benefit that sediment isn't always an issue, but the water will often be like tea without milk in it. That's not unusual. In fact, if you're looking at the uh, visibility scale that the cave diving group uses, and it tends to go from like Guinness (laughs) <laughs> which is not very good at all. And it does go to Pachin, which is incredibly clear. But the yeah. first three would be Guinness, Brown Ale and Pedigree. And Pedigree is perfectly fine for most diving wow. uh, in context. That'll do you fine. Um, one reason why you don't get that many images from the Dales is just like, there's some very nice bits, but it will always look like you put a, a brown winter soup filter on it, really. <laughs> yeah. we've, we've been doing quite a lot of diving up in the, in the Lake District and short of mm. Wass Water, which... Mm is very clear but when you get to depth so beyond sort of 20 meters looking up it's got this green hue to it and um, but all all the others are just like you said like a degree a varying degree between a different type of beer yeah i love love that analogy that's great well it's quite accurate yeah that's it many many cavers can still visualize what a pint looks like and you go yeah well one of those you can look into the murky depths and it'll be it might be satisfying but you're not going to see very much Mm. Through to ah, the sunshine glints through it occasionally, although in caves you don't get an awful lot of sunshine, of course. So, so what's the draw to you? What, what, what empowers or what's the passion behind if you, if, if the visibility, me as a diver, I, I enjoy visibility because I take a lot of photographs and video footage and that. So, what in crap viz or not as great viz <laughs> as you know, 40 meters of clear blue ocean, what, what's the draw for you to get in the water and, and explore that way? Mm. So at that point, you're looking at all sorts of different motivations, and that will yeah. vary um, on any given day and where you're going. So sometimes it's just you're doing a commute uh, and you're going to see some cave on the other side. 
Um, and that's still the case. There are still in this country any number of sumps that be anything from 20, 30 metres to 600 metres where you might actually be just going there to go and get out of the sump and go caving. Logistically, of course, there's an interest there because how do you manage, say, a longer dive and then dry caving the other side yeah. and then, of course, put it all back together and get yourself out, you know, happy and contented. Uh, so you might be doing that to just go to see um, cave, to explore new cave, yeah, uh, multiple sump dives. So you might be hoping for, for better visibility further you, in you go. Um, so it'd be that. Sometimes it's just a question of, um, because you'll never get perfect visibility. There are certainly sites um, where you'll wait for weeks uh, and you'll wait for the best conditions. The best conditions will still be the sort of thing you wouldn't get out of bed for in some places, but it's never going to get better. <laughs> uh, and if you want to see what's there or you want to explore, yeah, you'll you'll wait for your best and then you go for it, but your best might not be very good or you might even have got everything set up get there and go oh blow it's still not that great but it's good enough to explore so you don't quite get it right or some does things you don't expect uh, sometimes just it's it's nice it's being in water I and mean, i think that's i think that with cave diving where quite often the the aesthetic thing in this country isn't there in the same way yeah. um, you just like the environment uh, and i think that's the thing where uh, i've always said you can you can certainly quit train cave divers to be better but there's a certain level of you you're born to it i think more so because the other the other benefits are not so obvious you've just got to go you're in water and it's great and I, so i found that i i uh, started diving at university mainly because you go i want to be a cave diver and that involved doing a bzac course back in the 80s uh, and i remember sitting in the deep end of oxford baths looking at kind of all the silt that you got in public pools at that point and little, you know, the corn plasters drifting past in the uh, current. Yeah. <laughs> but just sitting there with my head underwater and a mask on and breathing going, this is brilliant. I yeah. want nothing else than this. And I think that, you know, you don't get so many sticky plasters dodging along the bottom of some, so you do get other <laughs> stuff. Uh, but it's just like, if you like being there, then the visibility isn't such a big deal. You go, I'm going on the journey and I'm doing this and everything is working and everything just feels right. Yeah. You know, you know, I, if you think I should be able to see more than my hand on the guideline, why am I bothered? Then you, it's not so good. But if you go, well, I can see my hand on the dive line, a couple of other meters and I'm swimming for an hour or so. It's just, it's the best exercise in the world and you just feel in the right place. We had a similar discussion at Ullswater last weekend where <laughs> we went in with my old BSAT club and um, me and my wife went up and the first dive was, pint of guinness easily mm. at, at 35 meters mm. and she said oh, i'm not going to bother with the next dive because there's nothing to see i'm like exactly the what you just said then it wasn't that i was going looking for corn plasters but it was just being <laughs> in the water yeah. and so i coached her back in and we got in and, and it was a better dive it was clearer and we dived there was there was half a dozen of us so we dive with a different purring who seemed to have a better finning technique and navigation so they weren't kicking up all the you weren't just following a, a, a fog underwater of, of crap mm. We didn't find anything particularly interesting. You know, there was a few broken branches. Of, uh, I think there was a traffic cone and a load of perch, but that was it. Okay. But it was, again, it was being in the water time on my unit again, you know, that I'm, I'm still trying mm. to build up a, a number of hours that to feel comfortable. So going through different conditions for me is always going to be the best training rather than just going sitting in the bottom of Cape and Ray or Ecky Delph, just sitting there at 15 meters going, right, the time's ticking away. Come on, we're nearly there. Yeah. Yeah. It's great, and I, I talk, so I totally get where you're coming from with that. Mm. But it's about experience as well. <laughs> is that, uh, as you say, you, if you only ever go for a swim in perfect conditions, then how much you're learning? You, what you're learning is how to cope with things being perfect. Mm. Uh, nothing wrong with that, because if you're doing it for fun, crack on. Yeah. Um, if there's other things going on in terms of exploration, or like you say, getting time on your unit and all sorts of things, then the learning happens when you've got that diversity, isn't it, really? Yeah. Exactly so. You know, 40 hours sitting in the big blue is great, but probably 10 hours, you know, in quarries, in lakes, in rivers, and everything else, and it's all different. You go, ah, I've got lots to assimilate, but as long as you mm. do that thing, then you, you, you know, it's all about learning process. Yeah. See, I was, I thought I was having a nightmare with 
my buoyancy and trim. I had my camera in there, so I was trying to do stuff. Just, just again, to sort of task load myself to make it harder. I like that mm. idea of train hard, fight easy. And when I got out, I said, oh, I was flipping awful in the water. You not see me? I was all over the show and my trim was always out and I was struggling on the on the, on the the uh, safety stop and that. And she went, no, I didn't notice any of that. Now, I probably beat myself up as much as the next person. You know, I want to be as good as I can be. Mm. But if somebody else doesn't notice that I'm struggling, I must be doing it okay, I think. So yeah. I think that just speaks volumes about the kind of diving we do do and what you've just said there, you know, if you, maybe if, if you were to log 600 dives in the same dive site, that's crystal clear, it's just one dive logged 600 times, isn't it? Whereas mm. if you go 600 different places and you go through a, a variety of conditions from benign to the more extreme, it's a, it's a mass variety of, of logs, isn't it? And an experience yeah. that you can draw on then. Yeah. Although it's, it, it's interesting, and it only just occurred to me, having only been thinking about this for 30 years, is that, uh, is, you know, you get you get the learning possibility if you change your configuration and change what you do. But it does mean that sometimes you spend all your time learning about some new widget or thing you've done with your kit. And that's interesting in terms of, um, a, say, GUE approach, where you go, you spend a lot of time learning. But in, in, in terms of the kit, you maybe are doing one dive for 600 hours. Yeah. But that's okay because what you're not doing is learning about your kit. Someone else has done a lot of thinking and you're just kind of fine tuning. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you spend more time learning about other things instead, um, which kind of makes sense. So it's just, you, you know, it is um, many cave divers are quite tinkerers. You know, yeah. it's like, well, that went all right, but maybe I can make it better. And because certainly in the British context, there's like, no one does every does things the same way, really. I think in the, certainly that very traditional cave diving group context, is you probably spend quite a lot of time going, well, I've just changed the length of my bungee and I've tried putting a double wrap <laughs> around the neck of the cylinder and I've got a different clip and it's great. But you spend so much time concentrating on that. I do wonder, that's probably why our, our trim is invariably bottom walking. As, uh, <laughs> actually, that's not fair. Lots of CDG members now actually do know how to, they, they do flippering and all sorts of things that are really good and they don't actually you know crawl along the bottom of the house. <laughs> um, well, that was how it used to be, perhaps a yeah. little bit. And, um, you know, sometimes you spend so much of your time thinking about other things that just things, you know, issues of perfect buoyancy in midwater yeah. were concentrated about less. And, and that approach of uh, getting, getting the kit right and just changing things a bit at a time means you can positively improve on the central skills. There you go. Mm -hmm. So you grew yeah, up, look, is, it, is it walked in? You're from in Manchester? Yeah, originally, a long, long time ago, and has uh, walked in, then moved to Little Lever, uh, and then up towards the uh, north side of Bolton until I was 18. Yeah. Right. So how did that transpire that you then ended up into diving in caves and, and making a living from it? Oh, I don't make a living from it. I, I just sell caving kit. Um, I don't sell diving kit. Oh, heavens no. Um, well, usual thing. It was, I mean, my dad is really sporty. We never did anything like that. But where I lived uh, when I was... At secondary school, um, you could you could walk to go climbing because yeah. I didn't drive. Obviously. So you could go and you could you could go proper cracking at Wilson Quarries and all that if people know that way. Uh, and that got me in with mates at school who were more climbers. But then their family were climbers in the summer and cavers in the winter. Right. Uh, so when you know that was this is kind of just before climbing walls really took off and yeah. before you could do cheap flights to the sun in the winter. Um, so over winter time, it'd be like we get a lift to the Dales, and my mates, dad and uncle, would give us a lift, and they would go and do proper caving trips. And it, they'd drop three or four of us, and we'd grovel around in caves that they thought were reasonably safe. Yeah. Um, and you know, at that point, I would have been either a climber or a caver. Uh, could have been either. I love both, and I was doing both. Um, I do remember, in terms of the cave, and there's one time we've been. Uh, left in this cave in the Peak District, and I got in with me like ex German army tank suit and a woolly hat and a dive torch, so I had a good torch. Uh, and we crawled around in this cave for about an hour and a half, and we realized we crawled over the same boulder and through the same puddle three times. It's like, are we lost? Well, we're not lost because we know the way out, but we don't know what we're doing. Oh, uh, well, should we go out now? Uh, so that was great, you know, crawl around in water, get out wet, and it was about 
two degrees on the surface wow. uh, and we're waiting for our lift to take us back yeah um and so we're just standing there getting you know frost forming on the clothing and i remember standing uh, on uh, some of the lit and open fire probably burning rubbish and i remember standing in that and my feet gradually getting warmer as my boots melted but thinking oh that's really good i fancy doing that again which was completely random but it was it was an adventure with no one telling you what to do yeah and i think that's when caving as much as climbing became the thing mm -hmm. and if you're going to be a you know if you're a kind of young testosterone driven man um then if you're going to be a caver then you're going to be a proper caver and if you're going to be a proper caver you're going to be a cave diver uh so and the, the club i was at the the four people there were confronted by this lunatic going i want to be a proper cave and i want to be a cave diver and going and they're going he's gonna kill himself um which i didn't so far uh, so just that really, you know, it's, it's like, well, it looks like a really good thing to do. I've not really seen it on telly. I just read about it. Yeah. Uh, I've probably read uh, The Darkness Beckons, the early version. And rather than going, run a mile, you idiot, it's clear that everyone dies doing this. I thought, yeah. oh, that looks really interesting. Um, you know, young man's motivations. Um, See, the... Uh... I've got a, we've, well, we've got a couple of mutual friends, but Craig Ely, who's just just been inducted yeah. into the the uh, CDG down south, he keeps posting pictures on his Instagram and his Facebook, and uh, whilst the darkness does beckon, because it's that spirit <laughs> of adventure, and I'm not a big lad, I'm five foot six at a push, you know, I've got a thirty two inch waist, so I'm only you know Get you. pretty slight, <laughs> and I just think that some of them gaps he's getting in are just horrendous. So I've I've got this. Do you remember the the show on BBC years ago with Michael Burke called Nine Nine Nine? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, and I've got this vision of someone getting stuck in a pothole, and and the whoever's going in rescuing him's got a lump hammer to his pelvis to try and get him through. And I'm like, <laughs> there's just something about that. I just don't fancy it. But and then watching some of your videos on YouTube this morning, I'm thinking they are like so so tiny them gaps, and I I've never had a panic attack. I'm not claustrophobic, but I just think. If I shit myself there, I'd never live it down. <laughs> but it's but it's out. That's right. Yeah, but I mean, the only caves I've been in, I was in Gibraltar a couple of years ago on a diving expedition, and somebody we got a tour guide to take us through, and it was the formations, mate. Are, as you know, are just um, immense, aren't they? So I am drawn. I've got the book there. I keep meaning to read it. I've just not got round to it because I'm. I run too many stuff. I've got a business, a podcast, a, a marriage, I'm a dad. You know, it yeah, just never yeah. happens. But if you mention it, I think I'll dig it out because I'm away next week and I've got a chance to read, so I might take it with me. But like the, the logistics side pecks my head a little bit because hmm. there can be kilometers between sumps, can't they? See, there's a lot of carrying of kit. And one of the pictures I came across on your Facebook, you've got a flipping canoe down there. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that must oh, be that like one. a... <laughs> a collapsible one or something because if them gaps are so small how have you got that down there and why if you can swim it anyway no no that's that's now to do with me that's historical yeah that's the one at the bottom of the uh the cave at c4 wasn't it and what that was and it actually it was a narrow little beast of a cave that in places yeah. uh, but they got this sump that was like 70 meters long and you can about 10 meters wide and the thing is that when they got there which would have been the 90s you've still been on carbide light uh, right. and for the you know divers amongst you that's the one where you dropped water on acetylene and produces acetylene flames you're literally going around caving with a with a flame wow. on your head uh, and they awesome. were brilliant um yeah and you know certain generation expeditionary cavers you get that smell of carbide which is like rank garlic but it makes them think of like you know youth and holidays uh, but when you got a carbide light, you won't be able to see 70 metres. And so if you've gone down, what, 600 metres down the cave and through some fairly gnarly bits, you don't really want to go stripping off and swimming in four degrees water. So they got the, the, the floaty boat down there to go as far as they could and see if it was just a lake that you'd pass across rather than not. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, all credit to them. They've done some very hard work to get there. Uh, for me, it was, it was just one of those historical things. You go, oh, yeah, that's where my mates were about, you yeah, know, whatever, 15, <laughs> 20 years back. Yeah. That's awesome, it, isn't it? It's a, lot of, it's a lot of stuff to carry. Uh, and certainly the thing, um, the, the issue is that you've gone through something and you've got a long carry and it's just like, don't break anything. Because yeah. especially if, you, if, you, if you're a fair way underground, then you'll t you've got to balance that, your spares, 
and you know spare that you take down in the first place the stuff that you take through the sump and stuff that you can carry on the far side and there's a whole load of balances there in terms of what you can ask people to get to in the first place what do you really need and what is sensible for you to take beyond as well and the more sumps there are the more you've got to kind of balance that as well uh I, yeah i mean i do remember there was a cave in spain a few years back and that it was it was a tough one um mainly because it would have been a team of three and then for various reasons it turned into a team of one uh, and it's just logistics but you know so st the, all the spare stuff was coming down to the first sump and that was like a two-day caving trip to get it to the first but it's not that bad you know it's a little you just you've got to go you've got to get it the stuff at the mountain then you got it down a cave for two days you know two days to get there without breaking too much of it and you had these series of sumps and there was three short ones but then you had about half a kilometer of not bad passage, but climbing and a bit of crawling and and very loose and sharp because very few people have been there. Mm -hmm. The people who've been there before would have been uh, Phil Rousel and Jason Mallinson, who are names you'd certainly have heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's then just getting all the kit for one person to push the final sump. And what should have been three people with a bit of spare turned into one person just doing repeated carries. And that was that was tense. Because uh, you just go, I, you don't want to break anything. Because although the first sumps are only like 200 meters and shallow, you still don't really want to trash stuff very much. Because no. um, you know the, the help is an awfully long way away at that point. Yeah. Do you and have you... like um, an unwritten rule in regards to damage of kit when you're down there? You know, like I'm assuming you've got your kit, your mate's got his, and the third person's got theirs, or or is it like a, a, a team of kit, like a team's worth of kit? And then if it breaks. Uh, the reason I'm asking is so I came across a situation a couple of weeks ago that that something got broken, which the discussion about the blame is still out there. You know, somebody was helping retrieve kit, it got broke, and there's there's a discussion about who's to blame, who's who's going to bear that cost. Yeah, uh, well, I think it, certainly in this case it would have been impossible because uh, everyone else there was pretty much Russian, apart from a uh, uh, Spanish lad who I've came yeah. a lot, uh, and also I think I think the stuff to get me through the sump and to push it was like eight or nine tackle bags you know it was, it was a rebreather it was a small cylinder a couple of bigger cylinders dry suit yada 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 uh so when one cylinder turned up at the sump in fact with the tap knocked off and it turned out later it was empty i have no idea who did that i mean it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious because you just sit there looking at it going i don't believe that you didn't notice that you'd knocked the tap off the cylinder and when all the air came out you didn't notice it, but clearly the, <laughs> oh, sorry, Tony, there's no gas in the cylinder. You might have wanted it, but it's enriched the air, the air in the cave instead. <laughs> uh, there we go. But I think that was lost in translation somewhere. Yeah. Uh, that, that was, in fact, the spare cylinder. So that's good. I had, I had one spare cylinder, and that's the one that they killed. Uh, but, mm. you know, in this case, uh, you go, they've set up an expedition, and they're doing loads of stuff, but they're putting a whole load of time in to get us divers to the base of this whatever 1400 meter deep cave if something gets broken there's really no point in having a you know you you might look a bit sad but a big shout if it isn't going to help anyone it's done it wasn't intentional yeah. um and they're putting aside an awful lot of time so that you can get your jollies yeah you know, absolutely. There's, as you know there's no great joy in carrying a cylinder anywhere let alone down the cave <laughs> no uh, so it's nice if they don't break it but there yeah. you go I mean, I've I've made a point of making sure, certainly the stuff that I wouldn't want to replace, you know, because of the sheer cost, I've just made sure it's insured correctly, you know, because yeah. last thing I want to do, that, may, that JJ that I bought last year, you know, they're, they're flipping expensive rebreathers, aren't they? You know, so if, if it oh, gets right. dropped or if it gets lost, you know, quite often I'll leave it at the side of my van when I go to the toilet or to the cafe, just let it dry out. If it walks, if it sprouts legs and walks off, well, I'm mm. tough, isn't it? So it is insured. Yeah. Yeah, it makes well, a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. It doesn't really help you when you mainly want it to work, of course. <laughs> no. <laughs> Insurance is only good afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I and mean, I must say that if it's a, there's a rebreather, and I've never got a commercial unit, though I'm, I'm getting one next, it must be said. I've had a couple of home builds, and I will yeah. tend to carry those just because, you go, know, yeah, they're, they're delicate little babies, and I want to know who's been kicking it and how much. Yeah. And and that is the one where you go, if it gets broken, I want to know that it's me. You know, it, these things happen. But, yeah, certainly if, if you've got a unit, yeah. you go, yeah, I think I'd rather have that by me, really, more than anything else. Yeah. Um, because it's, the I guess, unlike 
open circuit mainly works it doesn't cause a rebreather it's like it's the subtle things that bite your yeah. bum really mm. well that's yeah. opened a new can of worms tell me about these homemade rebreathers that's the first <laughs> i've heard it, oh blimey it's 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 not a big deal i mean i've mainly what i've, I've used it's always been for a specific purpose mm. uh, and i've tended to go for the semi-closed just because uh, i'm i'm quite diligent but i'm not a technician by any means so you're looking at the stuff where you go if i can understand what's going on in my head at all times then that's okay and so for a long time in terms of um the ccr i just wasn't comfortable enough to yeah. think i can see what's going on it's, it's not where my abilities lie um and the the one i probably used most was a side mount i was just a side mount pendulum and that was particularly for a caving trip where we're going to do uh it's kind of a, a traverse of the mountain so we had this cave that was about 1200 meters deep. this is in spain the cave is about 1200 meters deep and a series of six sumps at the bottom uh, and then a chunk more cave and it comes out into this gorge and it's a brilliant trip no one ever actually done it before uh, the through trip and we needed to just have a bit of space so that you could dive the sumps but also cope with any broken lines or what have you um, and because the logistics are carrying cylinders you go well if i put a um, an h valve on something like a four litre yeah uh, and then this side mount rebreather to balance it then it would give me you know your bailout is i can always get back to the nearest dry land and we'll work it out from there mm. um but you wanted something that you could carry in and, and take through the cave as well uh, and um a friend of mine who i will not name is quite a well-known cave diver uh, did a lot of the work for me I, I said well can you make it like this and uh, he's got a lathe so he did some lathing and what have you um, and it worked really well and it's literally the, the spec was it wants to be really simple pendulum semi-closed uh, and about the size of a five litre cylinder and the least number of parts uh, so uh, when you use it it's just you count your breaths you exhale through the nose um, just just really simple you go can you count to four yes breathe four exhale inhale bam and you've yeah. just got that slight multiplication um of how far of how long you can spend so it's not really how far you go at all because that's predicated on your bailout yeah but if you've got to faff with line you just got the time to do that yeah. um so that was the one that we used uh me and my mate paul mccrill and he was an open circus and i had the, the semi close and that worked quite nicely and it just gave a bit more time and line was buried to fix that and not go oh blimey how many you know how much have we got left right uh, and then because it worked which is the main thing that you ask then it was um used it then in slovenia and that was really nice again because you could go down with this cylinder and a little side mount uh and some of the guys i was caving with were like pair of sevens and and somewhere else as well and you go well i'm just a bit easier to carry for which is um it sounds daft but it makes you very saleable if you you know what you've got to do as a cave dive you've got to try and produce the goods you definitely got to come back alive because that's obviously a drama for the people who are carrying for you if you don't so you've got to maximize your chance of that but if you make them work a little bit less hard and are not kind of really high maintenance then you're more likely to get people might be prepared to do it again or invite you back mm. um so in a sense that you know it's a very specific thing and you go it's not for big long dives but it is for is very good for the multi sump you know because it's robust yeah. and small and carryable um so that's the main thing that i've used uh, for those sort of dives right just really. touching on on you mentioned a h valve on that five liter yeah i'm assuming that you've got one first stage regulator going into your rebreather feeding your yeah. nitrox have you and then yeah. you've got the other one is your your bailout yeah exactly so, open circuit yeah yeah <laughs> um, really, I, I, that, that I, makes real good sense that actually it's, it's, it's worked so far yeah. you know it's, it's always like life it's a work in progress but it just made me feel more comfortable as just there's there's one you've got you've doubled up again you know if you yeah. lose a rebreather you can shut it down you know that i'm really keen on being able to shut things down very quickly and without lots of faff because certainly with the small cylinders if it starts to go whoosh then you need to act quickly of course yeah um but it does mean it's easy to shut it down and go straight onto your oc and then you're you know, you've got a chance to run away sensibly. Yeah, I did, um, w again, watching one of your, your videos, and it was about the REO Dream, that um, I'd seen someone, and he had a y, a y valve on his, and I thought, oh, that's strange. I've seen them. Um, it was We were in Fort Ventura, and a lot of the cylinders have either got H valves or Y valves on, 
Mm. And um, I, I, whilst I understand why you would use one, I didn't contemplate that it might be because he had a rebreather also in his gob and it might be for that. But that's really clever. Like you said, it's one less cylinder, one less piece of equipment to yeah. carry and go wrong perhaps or lose. Yeah, and that, that, in that case, it was again, it's one of those where you've got a deep cave and you go, well, I knew the bar ice assumption shouldn't be very long, but you want to be able to do perhaps multiple dives because we're ex expecting to get to dry cave on the far side to make this connection. Yeah. But you might need to, it might be that because no one ever done the journey between the two, maybe there's more sumps, maybe there's other stuff to find. Yeah. And that one exactly meant that you could actually do two dives. But, you know, in fact, there could have been more, but you had time for two. And I think that would have been probably the seven in that case. And there's, you know, you probably could have done it on open circuit, but you could have done a load more with what you got, you know, because mm -hmm. I was never really using that, the the seven very much at all for what, 150 meter dive, you know, nothing, nothing too mad, but you could just do that commute repeatedly. Mm. So um, going back to your bio that you sent me, this is quite funny, this. <laughs> you said about open water diving. It's not your bag, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's not. I, every every so often, you know, and it looks great, but every so often I'll go there, I'll get in the water and go, this is horrible. I'm just, I'm thirsty. I've got heartburn. I think it's literally in fresh water, you know, you, I, I, you, just, you get the guppy lips. It doesn't matter. You get a bit of leakage and it's just, well, it's like mouthwash. You know, it might, it might be a bit, you know, silty, but basically it's fine. There's no problem. And you go into the sea, and unless you're clamping down like the narrow mouth frog, you know, you've got this water <laughs> coming in, and it's like, this is horrible. You know, it's like, oh, look, that's a very nice fish. Yeah, I could go to an aquarium, and I just feel really rough. And <laughs> no, I, all credit, it's great. I'm, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you'll love it, but it's it's salty and it's nasty. And, and I, I just saw Jaws too young. It's true. It's like, you know, there's, there's nothing between me and the great white sharks apart from distance. And that's not up to me, that amount of distance. <laughs> I, I mainly joke, but it's just like, it's great. I can see why you do it in theory, yeah. but the practice of doing it is just, and it is literally it's like, it's salty. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the reason I raise it, other than the fact I thought it was funny how you'd worded the the, the only thing between you and a great white shark was distance, um, is that for me, I wouldn't consider myself like an underwater explorer. The, the diving we do is to sites that are known, you know, so we can read up and research about it to some end. We know the depth, we know how much gas we've got on our back or our side, or whatever, so we can plan the dive and, and go and dive that plan as such. The impression I get from a lot of cave divers is that it's more exploratory. You know, you're going breaking new ground and, hmm. and finding new stuff. So how can you equate for those depths? I know, I know obviously some of the, the depths of the water, they're only increasing because of the depth. You're not actually in much more than 10 meters of water, for example, but then that has gone down 100 hmm. meters. So if that's new ground, how can you plan or have a gas plan for that? Is that pretty complicated? Have I, have I asked that in a way that anyone would understand it when they listen back? I don't know. I, I completely get it, absolutely. Uh, and the answer is, yes, it's it's at least as complicated as you say, and then more so because what you're doing is you, and this is where the uh, understanding of caves still feeds into the cave diving is that, and this is anyone who understands caves might be from a mainly diving background. Like if you're in Mexico and you're in Cenotes, brilliant you probably know how it all works it's about judging what's going to happen next it's exactly that you go okay so it's in this thickness of limestone and it's at this angle of that it's formed so we can assume that probably if i'm going to go somewhere it's going to stay at a similar depth so it's going to increase you know if we've got an angle of dip of x degrees then over the next 300 meters of penetration it's likely to add on a certain amount of yeah. depth uh, so you can plan reasonably well. I mean, you, you're always, you know, the, your basic rule of diving to thirds, which some people will be more conservative, which is perfectly valid. But, you know, the diving to thirds will keep you in terms of your gas planning. Uh, what you then have to do is to be as um, safe as possible in terms of, say, your bailouts and certainly your decompression. So the interesting one is always uh, you go to a site uh, uh, exploring and suddenly it goes deeper than you expect and you you at that point you go well I've got loads of gas not really sure about the decompression obligation so it's time to run away and again um, 
have that in a, another cave in Spain that we expected would be short and shallow uh, and went there with like a pair of fives in a wetsuit going, ah, glory, there'll be more dry cave and it will be brilliant. Uh, and the little beggar went along for about 20 metres and then just dropped down to 35, uh, which on a wetsuit was like, which is fine, but it's just, it's just kind of do, 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 down and 35. And you go, yeah, this is great. I'm just going to go a bit longer. And you go, hang on, I'm at, I'm a, you know, 37. I'm in a wetsuit on a pair, on a pair of fives. This is looking good, but it's not surfacing. And if I go now, well, I'll do, you know, I'll hang around and do a bit of safety stops extra, but because it's colder than you'd expect, but that was fine. Mm -hmm. But the answer is just, if in doubt, run away. Yeah. Tough one, because was, that was basically the entire expedition to get me to pass this sump. But the, the, in this case, <coughs> all the surveys we had of the caves and all the Georgia was completely wrong. It's like, it wasn't shallow. It was deep. It wasn't for the kit we got. Well, it's easier to carry a pair of fives out than a dead diver. So let's, yeah. uh, let's take the kit out. Live to fight another day. Well, actually, yeah, that one really, really kind of cheated because we went back next year with a rebreather, uh, someone else's rebreather and a dry suit. Uh, and it went along and then in the, just the bottom dropped out of the world and it got to minus 48 and looking down into this diminishing blue to black void. Yeah. Um, thinking, blimey, wasn't expecting this either. Uh, at that point, fortunately, the, the rebreather went gurgle and I thought, time to run away. <laughs> Um, much less heroic most most of my stories about running away but there you go here i am to tell them um but that one just it, that one we think must go down to at least minus 60 which is really deepest sump in the area of that yeah. part of the mountain um would love to go back there not by that route because that was again a couple of days caving underground camping all that to get there um but that in fact ties into resurgence we now probably can guess where that cave inlets and it'd be nice to go back through the resurgence, which has still got a certain amount of hard work, and take the rebreather there and try and connect it from the downstream end. But knowing that you've got, you know, you're definitely on rebreather territory and it has to work and, you know, really plan for that as well. Yeah. How, um, how do you go about sort of finding new stuff? I mean, like, there's a guy local to us. He, he owns a, a shop. I'm sure you'll know him. Mark, his name is. He used to be in the, in the Royal Navy. He's got a shop, a shop hmm. called Shipmates. And he's always okay. up in... In, in Yorkshire, he's CDG, and he's he's always digging stuff out, and you know he'll spend a few days up there on his own digging and trying to trying to break through and stuff. But short of like, I know you all have each individual CDG has their own like logs, don't you, and journals. Well, and and you've got the great advantage that we're we're quite good at publishing. Um, some people will be laughing at this. I'm very bad at publishing, but I do tell people what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But the um, the sump index that will give you. Every cave that's got a known sump in it, and it'll sometimes just say this sump is undived, and generally it's because it's like it's obviously two meters long, someone stuck the welly in it and went it's too small. Yeah. So if you just study the 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 index, you'll get a whole load of stuff. Um, and the only downside is if a sump hasn't been dived or it's gone so far and has been left, there's probably a blooming good reason. And it'll either be the sump is death on a stick, or it's not, but it's just, you know, what you're looking for best is. Uh, it was at the limit of what the previous generation could do in terms of cylinder size or lights, or something. It's worth having a look at. Uh, but generally, it's, it's a horrible carry, or it's nasty. Uh, so you make your choice about well, some horrible carries have perfectly nice sumps at the bottom, but you've got to get yourself and come into team to get there, and yeah. hopefully do it repeatedly. Um, or you just have to accept that it's going to have you know, lots of deco or no viz or nasty bits or loose bits or what have you. Um, but there's stuff to do. Um, the Dales has, has got a lot to find, although a lot of easy stuff has been found. Yeah. Um, go over to Ireland and there's a lot more there uh, still. Uh, is, there, is, is, is there less communities over there doing that? Is that why? There's a really good diving and caving community in Ireland now, but probably it would have started in the 70s and 80s rather than the 50s um i would say that the, the, the irish need no help from the brits uh yeah. they're, they're really good at pushing their own stuff uh, but if you go over there and recognize that you're a guest in someone else's country and you are sensible about it it's a good place to go you can generally find stuff which is interesting nice one but it's it's one of those like whenever you go and if you you know if you if you go to france and you're diving in the lot then it's not a great drama but 
if you went to the lot, you would still and um, were aiming to push. You'd probably look at what the local sensibilities were. Now you're stepping on someone else's toes. <laughs> and the same would very strongly go for Ireland as well. Yeah, right. and the so many things and so few divers that they're, they're spread quite thin. Right. Yeah. When you said you you're perhaps not the best at publishing, are you someone who does document throughout the dive, like with cameras or notes and 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 survey and that kind of stuff? I, I do survey. I don't do photos. I I, I will write it up. Uh, sometimes yeah. there's a bit of a delay for me if I've got a project. I sometimes think, well, people need to know where I am, but I'm not necessarily gonna. Um, tell people what I'm doing all the time because and I've, I've got a place I'm going to be diving sometime soon um touch wood and mainly what I'm doing is I'm just I'm just carrying dive kit down and saying oh look at me I'm carrying another cylinder down the cave it's like well, that's very boring and it's yeah. like there is progress at some point there'll actually be a dive that will do things but mainly I'm just saying yeah I'm doing some work here it, mm -hmm. no one needs to know what I'm doing otherwise not by being secretive just it's not exciting yeah, yeah. If I do some of which is of interest to other people or even if it's just like you're sorting out the line then you let people know where it affects other people you let them know if there's nothing to see then you don't show them Fair one. <laughs> yeah so um this um starless river i can understand why you've called your business that and it makes total sense because it is what it is, isn't it? You look up, there's a black sky, <laughs> but it's mm. not. It's just a top at cave, isn't it? But uh, yeah. do you want to talk about your business a little bit and how our people can sort of reach out to you for whatever reason they might want to? <laughs> not really. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it's what I do. I'm completely unemployable by other people at this stage. I, I was uh, head of an outdoor centre for 10 years for my sins. Uh, that made me very much my own boss. There was no new... Yeah. No one above me in seniority knew what was going on so it was up to me to make it work and and then i thought blow it if i'm going to work for okay i'll say if i'm going to work for an idiot i'll work for me as an idiot not anyone else <laughs> um yeah no offense to me previous employees who are lovely in many ways um and it's what i do i i go caving a lot i've done it for a long time i think about stuff uh i loved going into caving shops when I was younger and kind of the, the, the toy shop element. And it is a thing. Uh, and I try and do that. I try not to take money from people for no reason because uh, they've got to come back. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, what I'd say is um, the nice thing about being a shopkeeper who does caving kit is that it's a small community and it it sounds really minimal. It keeps you honest and it keeps you decent because if you don't look after someone properly, they won't come back and you need mm -hmm. them to come back. So it's quite nice. You've got no temptation to, to kind of do a quick deal because that doesn't work. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it makes it makes you part of the tribe, which is kind of nice because in, you know, I, I always was. I mean, it's a it's a community, the caves and cave diving community. It's small. You can get to know what a lot of people are doing. And that's. It's nice. It's you know, it's part of that belonging thing. Um, you know, cavers are all not equally nice people, but they're all pretty good when they're doing what they do. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's why I do it, uh, and I will happily chat about kit. I try and most of the stuff that I sell, I've not used, but most of it I do, and if not, I'll ask someone who I trust. Um, mm. That really. It's a good a good sort of business model, that. and what I liked when I looked on your website earlier that. You, you do like drop offs, don't you? So if you were diving in a particular area, you'd take a load of people's kit for them and stuff like <laughs> that, which which just breeds that sense of community and sort of like a, a business friendship as such, which yeah. I, I mirror that in my business, although it's a completely different one. I, I work in pest control and property maintenance, mm -hmm. but I, I equally feel that, you know, building up a friendship and a rapport with your customer keeps them returning. Yeah. Well, it's in, in a sense, it's, it's almost difficult well, it's not difficult, but it's one of those where people have to learn that you go, um, there aren't mates rates, but they can't because some of these people I've known for like 20, 30 years, long before I was a shopkeeper. Yeah. Um, and it, at that point, you could almost get, oh, who gets the bigger discount? Who's who's your better friend? Which is like, oh, tosh. Um, <laughs> most people understand, you go, you get your prices right, you do it for everyone. Uh, but on the other hand, I will be the person who might help you in other ways. You know, yeah. so it's true. Um uh, I see my customers in the best place. I see them when they are going caping and they're having fun, uh, and that's great. I could be, you know, I could be a doctor, I could be a lawyer. I see people when they're ill or scared or unhappy, and that's dismal. I get to mm. see people when they're absolutely gleaming best, 
Yeah, I like uh, that. Of course, of course they're friends. Why wouldn't they be? We've all got something in common. Mm. You know, uh, again, unlike being, well, what's your doctor? What's in common? Well, the person who sees you is, is ill and you're not <laughs> ideal. That's not in common. That's a great big barrier. For me, you go, well, the only barrier is that I watch people go and caving when I'm working at the weekends and I sit there being a shopkeeper, uh, which is the <laughs> downside. Um, yeah. you, know, you go, oh, do you want to go caving the weekend? No, I'm at work. I may sit here drinking a cup of tea and having a natter, but this is actually work, especially yeah. in the sense of, well, if I wasn't doing this, I'd probably be caving or diving, but I'd have to sit here. But then again, I'd much rather sit and chat to people who I like, talk about things that they like doing and I like doing mm. uh, than any number of other jobs. So it's it's work, but there's, there's far worse ways to make a living. Absolutely. Is, is mind diving your kind of thing or not? Is it caves only? No, not particularly. Um, which is interesting because, uh, you know, when I say, oh, it's about the swimming, about the journey, it is. I think that mines for me are a little bit samey. Yeah. Possibly if I did loads more of it, I would, I would get to love it. Uh, but there's just so much cave to have a go at that mm. I don't need to do mines as well. I mean, I think last time I was in a mine was um, uh, in Linley, which is Birmingham area, just for, for training. Yeah, uh, and that was uh, that was a good one. That was that was that was uh, borrowing uh, Mr. Stanton's rebreather, one of his very early home builds. Really, uh, and it was yeah, it was it was really good. But it was, um, at one point, I just I wasn't quite getting on with it, so I just kind of sank to the floor and just sat there having a bit of a grump to myself. Um, <laughs> That's like every one of my dives on my rebreather, mate. Every single one of them, I have a grump to myself. Why am I even bothering? Yeah, yeah, and it was, it was, it was just me, you know. It's like I'd be better. So I'm sitting there, kind of grumping away, and then some poor um, other diver comes along and obviously sees this prone figure at the bottom of the sump with no breath coming out. <laughs> and I kind of worked lights and kind of went around and went, "Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, mate. Don't worry." <laughs> Yeah, that's the only so, thing you can't have a grump on a rebreather in the same way because it looks a bit alarming if anyone else sees yeah. it. <laughs> um, <laughs> in in your bio, you you said about you do you the reasons you sort of do or what you get from dive uh, from caving and cave diving is recreational to start with, but then you you do a little bit of the exploratory stuff. Do you in any way instruct people? So whether it be caving or the, the sort of sump diving elements of it, is that your thing? It's it's not. I there's a pause there because you go no. I I don't instruct anymore. I used to. Um, I wouldn't do it so formally, and I have no qualifications to do so that are that are, that are current, and I'm not insured anymore. To be yeah. absolutely clear, um, I will happily give advice. Um, mainly, it's it's don't do this or you'll die. Uh, but. Um, the problem is that just as a, as a really busy boy, I think that if you're mentoring someone seriously, then you need to be there for them all the time. And I think I can't do that. So I'll very happily help people if they ask uh, and they've got all my time in the world. Yeah. I think it's really important to do that, to, to give back, uh, but not formally. I get you. But, you know, I think there's a, there's a few people I've tried to kind of be helpful to, but it's mainly sometimes like, don't ask me to be your mentor, but ask me about this, this and this. And yeah. some sort of things I might have more experience for, and then I'm, I'm very, very happy to pass that on. Yeah. Uh, although I was saying this is my experience; it's not a, it's not a rule, you know, mm. at all. The things which I found and they matter to me, and these things are important, and I concentrate on these things. Um, but I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't feel that it was appropriate to say that what I say is definitely the case. Yeah, for me, I'm careful that, with that. With with what I put out on YouTube. I, I'm quite careful to say this is how I've been taught. This is what mm. I've adopted. This is what suits me. And then, you know, for instance, using um, a long hose, whether it be on a single, on your back, twin set, side mount, I use a long hose and I like it this this way. And then I spoke to Robbie Schmidtner out in Mexico. He uses two single hose, uh, two short hoses off his side mounts. That's his way. It's not necessarily that mine's wrong and his is right. It's just his is, is preferred and works yeah. in every single way. If you're going to hand off a cylinder to someone, you, you, that's what side mount's about, and you're going to give it away, really. You're not yes, going and to... not strangle yourself in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, But but that's that's what suits me, because every configuration I dive, short of back-mounted CCR, I've got this long hose. So hmm. you as my buddy, whatever you see on the front, always the same. It's just my cylinder location's different. So that's what I like about that. I can explain to one person, and they know 
pretty much what they see is going to be what they get every time. So yeah. it suits me, but I don't instruct either anymore. It's, I, I totally agree with you. you. You've got to invest an awful lot of time to get it right with that person, which is why professionals are probably better because you've got them for a consolidated period of time rather than every other weekend where knowledge is forgotten and yeah, perhaps missed. Hmm, absolutely. Uh, and that's why I think courses are very important as well. And, you know, it's that whole range of things in terms of course, which will get a lot of information into you quickly. And ideally a lot of it sticks uh, and then your own personal development and then mentoring as well. And they can all bring different things um, and people learn in different ways. Um, and for me, I'm, I think I'm reasonably good at the reflection, um, which is good, but it does mean that sometimes I've learned very, very slowly and I've certainly reinvented the wheel into a really good oxygen several times, but that's because <laughs> it has come from my need. And then later on, you kind of read more widely and go, oh yeah, that. But if you come up with it yourself, at least you completely own it. You're not doing it because um, someone told you. I, always, I often say to customers, whatever you do, uh, you know, for, for single rope technique or what have you, don't just trust someone just because it's a middle-aged bloke with a beard and then I sit there being a middle-aged <laughs> but Don't do that. Work out what, you know, listen to what they say and then work out why it's true. Get people to tell you why it's true rather than just because I say so and I'm terribly yeah. senior. I blow that. Um, if it goes wrong, they won't be there. You mm. have to know why something is being done. Yeah. I think that's vitally important. Yeah. Um, I think that certainly diving and cave diving is for people who have to take complete responsibility for themselves and not pass pass on responsibility but to someone else because in the end you're the person who's in the water and you're the person yeah. who has to sort it and you have to justify why you're there and you've got to have thought very hard about how you get home for that cup of tea mm -hmm. that's a very good segue to my sort of final part of this you talked about um <laughs> I've got to laugh because it's funny how you worded your biography, which I'll put in obviously the description of this, is that you've worked on quite a few rescues, but not the rescue, the only <laughs> one that anybody knows about that doesn't remember <laughs> Michael Burke's 999 from 20 years ago. <laughs> Obviously, that's the one, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so without going naming names and without you know too much gory details, can you tell us anything? about any kind of rescues that you've been involved in, you know, what the logistics, you know, the, the challenges, that kind of stuff about it. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just go with one because it's a happy one, which is always nice. Although yeah. spoiler, it's a happy one. A um, few years back, uh, there was a cave that lots of people were um, exploring. And one of the things they've done is that for a long time, there've been a, a 60 foot sump, which is quite low and silty, but they, they worked out a way of, um, bail, basically bailing that out and draining it. So people who go through the six foot sump and do lots of exploration beyond that mm. for about four decades had just been for cave dives and never been visited very much. And suddenly everyone could get in there and explore. Um, and folks who got into the habit of having really multi, multi people trips. And at this occasion, they'd had um, a much worse weather than they expected and ended up with about 40 people in the cave flooded wow. in. And they're, and they're rescued and essentially they couldn't get out and there are lots of cold people. Um, but they all, you know, everyone did very well and the cave rescue came in and got everyone out apart from two who were missing. Um, at that point, it became clear there's a good chance talking to other people who were already out of the cave that these folks were beyond, they were caving beyond this sump that had been drained, but undoubtedly was a sump again at this point. Yeah. Um, so at that point, the three of us went down and it's like, well, what are we going to do? Well, they're probably OK. They're probably beyond the sump and we need to get them out. Um, and so I think we, we thought about it. OK, we'll take one cylinder because it's a short sump and they won't be able to ask them to change isn't very good. Uh, we'll put them in dry suits because it'll fit come what may. Just really simple, no inflation. Um, and so we, we battled away down this cave. It was just drying up and we were in our, our full diving kit and get to this sump and you go, yeah, it's full and it's murky and it's probably full of plastic bags, which was a hilarious thing is that they've been, they've been kind of digging. So all the plastic bags used to fill spoil probably mushed into it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, draw short stuck straws, who goes through first, just to see if it's clear. And I got the short straw in this case. Uh, went through and it's great because you surfaced after just like 
three or four minutes of groping about in zero vis and kind of a bit low uh, and two lights there so it's it's like a miniature version of that rescue it's like you okay and you're like yeah I'm, you know thank what's it are we glad to yeah. see you uh and they've just been they apparently they've been digging once they were trapped they've been digging to keep themselves warm and then <laughs> when about 10 hours have gone by maybe someone's coming looking for us um and that was absolutely brilliant because they weren't divers at all but they were dead hard cavers and they just come back from two weeks in the red sea yeah. so it's perfect if you said to them so you say to them Okay, this is the man valve. You know, stick this in your mouth, clear your ears, follow me. And and they just did it, and they, and, and they were great. I mean, I, I actually I cheated. I just went through, found them, went back, and then someone else went and got them all kitted up and swam back with them. Yeah. That was a brilliant outcome because they yeah. just they held it together perfectly well. It's like the right mindset, but also you know. So that's one of those where classic where being the caver was most important because the fact that it's. Uh, 14 inch high bedding playing with loads of silt but it's still probably easier to go through in fact underwater than it was to crawl through it yeah. and because they had the skills yeah, well, they can clear a mask uh they can breathe through a gag and they can hold on to a to a line because that's no different to holding onto a rope when you're abseiling so really yeah. good result uh at that point like most rescues they then ran out of the cave at high speed leaving <laughs> oil at me going this is really tiring getting out because they've been sitting resting for 10 hours and uh, mm -hmm. highly motivated to get back to the surface um so uh -huh. that was a good one that was a, that was a good one uh, and they didn't do the thing which i heard of once someone who who nearly trashed himself in the sump as a non-diver because he thought his regulator wasn't working turns out it's because he was breathing through his nose <laughs> And of course, what you, if you've got like if you've got like you know a, a couple of minutes into some and you're a bit nervous before you take your first breath, and then it doesn't work, you don't think breathe through the mouth. <laughs> but fortunately, they didn't do that because they've been diving already. I just I'd share that story. Yeah. It's a like remember to breathe through the mouth when you're a diver. <laughs> yeah, flipping heck. That's unlucky though, isn't it? If this, if that was all drained out to the point you could just sort of scramble through it. Yeah. And then the weather's come in so bad that it's just filled up. That's yeah, that's really unlucky, that, isn't it? But then, isn't that what happened on the rescue in Thailand? Isn't that the same yeah, sort of scenario? scenario yeah, later. yeah, exactly that. Um, oh. And the same happened on another rescue um, donkeys years back, which was uh, also on film where the two lads got stuck beyond like a 300 meter sump in the Dales. And yeah. they got dived out because that was where, the, again, the weather forecast is getting worse. So you always have this thing of, do you take someone out through a sump? Or do you leave them? Well, in this case, in a, in a Dale sump, you mainly go, yeah, we need to get them out because, again, the forecast is bad. So you you make the call and go, well, we can't just supply them with, you know, tea and cakes. You need to actually get them back to the right side of the sump. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so one last thing I do want to touch on is the Ario Dream. I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I didn't think, well, I'll watch that tonight, last night. <laughs> to perhaps give me more. I mean, I, we've, I think we've talked about loads of stuff and I'm quite quite pleased with how it's gone this. Um, but the Aero Dream, I watched the sort of, is it like an eight or nine minute variant of it with you talking quite a lot about your, your rebreathing oh, and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, is, is that like um, one, of, <clears throat> sorry, I'll rephrase that. So you've, you've recorded a couple of films, it, it would appear, or you've been on a couple of films. Is that right? Well, I've that... said it this now because <laughs> it's not <laughs> shit. Well, so you've been in that one born as much as I like. Um, so that that wasn't originally about me at all. That that was hilarious um, because the, the, like I said, we've done this. The idea is that you've got these caves high in the mountains, and you've got the resurgence down at the Carrots Gorge. Uh, and me and me mate Paul, uh, we we didn't make the connection. That was done by back Chris Jewell back in you know, eight but we made the through trip in 2012 and that made this kind of you know 1300 meter deep through trip but although you know where the lowest point is you can keep exploring caves going up the mountain to make this deeper and deeper cave and potential through trip and that's the Ario dream uh, and in this case one of the connections was going to be made um, at the bottom of this cave c4 and Paul was going to be doing that and he was doing that I think in 20. 16 so the filming started there uh in 2016 and he did his dive and that did quite well but then um in fact it's 2015 so there you can edit this he dived in 2015 when i was there with him 
Uh, he was there again in 2016 and had and got a lot further in the sun, but then had an epic, had kind of like double valve failure. And if you see the film, it's kind of compelling when this uh, poor chap who is, you know, very capable person comes out and having had a, obviously particularly bad dive. I have out. seen it. Yeah, he yes, gets out uh, and he's like, he's rolling around on the, going, fucking hell, fuck. <laughs> and, and I would as well, frankly. And <laughs> I, 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 I sit there and cry while, while weltering in a wetsuit full of my own poo, frankly. Um, <laughs> you know, he did really well. Uh, unsurprisingly, after that dive, uh, he wasn't waking and going back and doing it again. I mean, he's, he's dived a lot since. He just yeah. he thought, this isn't for me. Uh, yeah. So, in fact, in 2017, I went back and go, okay, well, because it was Paul's sump, but if he didn't want it and we were mates, he was very happy to say, well, do you want to have a go at it? And so, in 2017, I was back there and got to, he'd done all the work, you know, just a line reel line there in the silt at the, at the elbow of the sump. And then it's just like, pick it up, follow the ripples, England home and glory. <laughs> you know, he did not work, frankly. Uh, yeah. But I was, I was just lucky enough to get there and actually kind of just lay the last bit of line, get it up to the surface and make the connection. Yeah. Um, that was good. That, that made the cave theoretically deeper. It's an ongoing project. There's a whole load of work to do. Um, we ain't going to Spain anytime soon, of course. That's the problem. Yeah. So at the moment, that's just sitting there. We all get um, older and less fit. But, uh, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of people that I think who would still be keen to do it. It's a beautiful area. Mm. I've... Uh... Mm. I've got to get this book read, haven't I? And just just see if I can get myself in. I used to love I, I used to love climbing, and unfortunately, when I sort of left that group of the army that I was in, mm. my circle of friends just it wasn't their bag, you know. So if you don't have that that group on on your doorstep, it's kind of hard, isn't it, to to develop a, a passion and and a hobby. It's, it's a tough one, and with the family as well, because you have to look at okay, so is it about me or is it about a bigger unit? Yeah. And it's like, so how much time can you spend with your mates and go to the crag or what have you? That's great. But you don't, you know, you have to make sure that your wife or partner gets some mm. stuff as well. And then you might go, well, it might be nice to go with three of us. Um, yeah. And you can do that when, when you've got a child who's really small. I remember going to the crag with, with really small child in the cot at the base of the crag where no rocks have fallen and just that's fine. Yeah. But then at a certain point you go, yeah, you don't really want... No. And also, you don't want to get to the point where you're leading some climb and going, oh, this is a bit sketchy, and then thinking, oh, I can fall off and make a big crater in front of my firstborn. Not motivated, <laughs> really. You know, so no. how you manage that is, is a thing altogether, of course. Yeah, I suppose yeah. I'm really lucky because me and my wife both learned to dive at the same time. <laughs> so she's as happy to dive the kind of dives I do as as anybody. So I've, I've always got that partner, but... Climbing just is, is, is t- taking a seat, a back seat. I mean, I've got a bag full of stuff up in my loft ropes, mm. harnesses, clips, carabiners, everything. Just it's not seen the light of day for years. So, um, well, you're in the right part of the world to do it. I and, mean, you know, yeah. there's been climbing around your way, as, as I yeah. remember very well. Um, but you can, you sometimes just have to take it in turns and you go, okay, this is the year that I do a bit more climbing and, and this is the year I do a bit more diving or what have you. And it's, Unless you've got a load of free time, which tends to be for people who are like twenty and in a slightly different domestic situation, you go, Well, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna maintain it one of these things and then I might do something else. And if you yeah. went to the south of Spain and did sport climbing, then you go, Oh, I'm just gonna do that and you know, that'd be great. But you can't do everything because there's not enough yeah. time in life. And and you can't do everything well, can you? And and in different ways, both climbing and diving, it's a good idea to be semi competent, really. Yeah. You know? You know, it's not like golf where you just go, oh, well, that was a bit of a bad day on the golf course, which is yeah, that, that, great golf, wonderful. I'm, I'm sure I'll be doing it in 20 years' time, so I'm not going to slag it off too much, otherwise it'll be remembered. <laughs> um, but you can't, you know, a bad day in the sun is potentially quite a bad day. A bad day at the crag is going to hurt, at mm-hmm. least briefly. So you want to, you know, you, you gauge what you're able to do, you work to that level, and you don't push it out, and you keep it safe. Mm, absolutely what a good note to end on mate i can't thank you enough for coming on i uh, well. I'm very inspired now i will, I will be pulling out <laughs> martin Farr's book and giving it a good read um i like to say i'm away next week and i'm on a little camping trip where i've not i'll be on my own and i have nothing to do um outside of the working hours because i'm a cheapskate mm. i'm not getting a and i'm gonna camp <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll sit there with uh, my little lead torch on giving it a read with a brew in my hand and um no doubt be hitting you up for some gear in no too short yeah, a time. You don't, you don't want to do that. Let me see. I'll see which, I'll see which edition I've got. Hang on. Yeah. 
Which edition is it? Ah, no. Oh, that, that one's good. That's, that's, that's How to Do It, which is a different oh, one no, than no. that. The Darkness Beckons, I'm sure I've got that. So the third one, which has got a nice... Again, it's classic. The, the third one's got a nice cover that makes you want to go diving, whereas the first one is like something in a silica mine, and it looks very murky and terrifying. Um, sure. Is it the one next to your white oh, folder? I, I have. Let's see. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That's, that's the one that makes you want to do it, and the, the cover is inspiring, whereas the early ones, they're very much like... It's, it's like the sickener factor. If you read this and you still do it, <laughs> yeah. then okay, you've only got yourself to blame. Um, right. Yeah, and that one, think... you know, that one makes you look nice, not least because the lights are actually bright enough to see by, and yeah. it's not all diving in South Wales. Right. 2017, yeah, so that must be the most common one. That's what yeah, I that's... thought when we were talking about it. I forgot yeah. about that one. Yeah. I'll have a job to read that in three days. I fix that. Well, yeah, 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 yes, exactly. So you need to kind of leave that in the car or something like that. Yeah. Happy days. Well, like uh, I said, Tony, I really appreciate you giving me an hour and a, an hour and ten minutes of your time, mate. And oh, it, it was everything uh, when Craig said I need to speak to Tony. Um, it was everything I expected, mate. So thanks very much. I really, really no, do appreciate it. Yeah, you, uh, so you, where are you off this weekend? South, South Wales. Um, so I'm in the. I'm in. Uh, I was in the Dales yesterday, carrying some cylinders down the cave. Yeah. Uh, I might dive this afternoon. It's the. All good about being self-employed is I've been there's a there's a dive I really want to do and I've got all the kit there and it was and it was just really busy to actually get the dive so I got all the kit in place and then the weather broke about three weeks back and I've just been sitting looking at terrible conditions uh, went down there yesterday and it looks like it might be diveable today it's just cool. what I've got to do is is to do my work for the day yeah uh, see if I can get a dive in. And then drive down to South Wales for work over the weekend. And it's kind of one of those go, well, do I do it today in a rush or do I do it on Tuesday? And I can't quite decide. Mm. Um, the forecast's good. But so, so uh, yeah, South Wales this weekend, if spared. Yeah. We're in North yeah. Wales tomorrow. We're, uh, no, yeah, t today is Friday, isn't it? So, yeah, tomorrow morning yeah. we're going. Got a, a mate of ours who's got a rib. We're going out to Puffin Island, have a dive on that. If the oh, visit's excellent. any better. Excellent. Yeah. And it, so, so it's when I, I'd love to dive with seals. It's just it's the sea. I'm not, I'm really not joking. I'm a hammer up a bit. But actually, <laughs> go, I will dive in the sea because I think seals are ace. Yeah. Uh, but I would still go. It was really good, despite the fact that I kind of within five minutes of going in, I had heartburn and felt like I wanted to drink a pint of coke. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're ace, mate. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, hopefully, I'll see you around some point. Um, yeah. You know, wherever I might be, I, my, I like sort of tagging along people's trip. I'm not begging for a trip here. I mean, you know, I, if, if there's something going on and I can get involved with it, I tend to tag along. So a lot of my mates yeah. invite me along to help out. So no doubt our paths will cross again. Oh, and, I don't uh, so. Right, go and have a nice weekend. Be safe. And I'll, uh, yeah, you too. I'll talk to you soon. Take it easy, pal. Yeah, have a good time in North Wales anyhow. Cheers, you Cheers. too. Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much to this week's guest for sharing their stories and interesting tales about the underwater world. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did recording it. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. Thanks again to Northern Diver International and those of you who have supported me through Patreon. Take care and I'll see you on YouTube.